Okay, I think we have a good number so we can uh, start kicking off now and people can still join as they're going. Uh, so welcome to this event, which is a, uh, a seminar of the Oxford Biodiversity Network and the Oxford Centre for Tropical Forests, uh, together with uh, many participants from our master's courses in environmental change and management and biodiversity conservation and management. So it's a, it's a nice, varied and, and healthy audience. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know our seminar series, we typically, throughout term time, have a, a seminar once a week in this series. That's it. You're all welcome to participate in. The normal time slot is Friday at uh, 4 p.m. And next week we have one on tropical savannas by Bill Hoffman. And the week after we have Robin Chasden on global ecosystem restoration. So anybody's welcome to register and join those. Uh, we'll put, uh, if you want to join our regular mailing list, uh, uh, please can't email Jane Applegarth. We'll put her name in the chat box and her email address there and you can just email her and you can join onto the, onto the regular mailing list. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's Professor Ruth de Vries. Ruth is Professor of Ecology and Sustainable Development at Columbia University in New York. And she uses images from satellites and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are, are changing land use throughout the tropics. And I know Ruth first from, our, from uh, working in Brazil in the early 2000s, where we were both involved in, in, a, in a project called the LBA, the Large Scale Biosphere Atmosphere Program in Amazonia, looking at land use change and climate change and its ecosystem interactions in Amazonia. Since then, Ruth's gone on to a range of other things. She's particularly uh, had a focus on the forests and people of central India, and uh, particularly working in a focal social ecological landscape in India. But uh, uh, she also, uh, has uh, an interest in thinking about the big picture, uh, about environment and, and science and, and society. A few years ago, she wrote a book called The Big Ratchet, which examined how human societies throughout history have responded to environmental challenges uh, and giving a very macro picture view, and sometimes provocative view of, of, of how environmental crises shape human history and, and, and human cultures. Uh, and more recently, she's got a book out uh, very recently called What Would Nature Do? A Guide for Our Uncertain Times. And that is the content of this lecture, looking at what lessons we can learn from natural ecosystems to understand resilience in, in, in the modern world. And she's had a number of accolades. She's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. She received a MacArthur Genius Award and is the recipient of many other honors for her scientific research. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Ruth in a moment. Uh, a reminder, feel free to use the chat box to suggest questions. I'll curate those questions and uh, in the various pauses that we have in the seminar, uh, I'll invite you to, to ask Ruth your question di directly. So feel, but feel free to use the chat box to propose questions and, and I'll, I'll direct them to, towards Ruth. I'll ask you to directly uh, ask them to, to her. And then also we have some time at the end for more general discussion as well. So Ruth, it's a great pleasure. Uh, over to you. Okay, I will share screen here. And I will thank you for that very nice introduction. And uh, we had the pleasure of having Yadvinder with us for an entire semester at, uh, at Columbia in New York in pre-COVID days, which seems like a very long time ago now. Uh, and that was wonderful to be able to spend some more time together after after our interactions in Brazil. So thank you very much for this, uh, this invitation to, to share this seminar with you and to discuss uh, some sort of abstract big picture ideas about the, uh, the Anthropocene. I understand that you've been properly welcomed to the Anthropocene and I, you know, it's really exciting to be alive at the dawn of a new geologic epic. It's frightening in some ways, but it's also very exciting. Not many generations can say that, that you were, you, that you were alive when the geologic epic uh, began. But we have very little, we meaning humanity at large, very little experience in, uh, in knowing how to live in this Anthropocene, in this human 
dominated world. So we have a lot to learn, which is also exciting. We have a lot of discovery to do, but we also have a lot of perils uh, ahead of us. But I want to step back for a second. Despite the really awful situation that the world is in today with COVID and climate change and many other catastrophes that we can think about. There's no better time to be alive than, than today, even with the COVID pandemic. If you want to stay alive, if you want your children to survive, there has been so much advance in sort of technical know-how in terms of literacy, child survival, life expectancy, poverty, if we just look back not very long ago, just a little over 100 years ago, uh, if you were born in this world, you would be far less likely to survive, far less likely to be literate, far more likely to die at a young age, far more likely to live in poverty, and your children would be more likely to die. So that tells us that humanity has come pretty far and we have a lot of know-how about how to improve human well-being by these metrics, generally health uh, metrics. But we also have a very long way to go in using that know-how for the benefit of everybody around the world and, uh, and addressing our very serious issues with uh, equity, injustice, and all of the other um, issues that we're dealing with in the Anthropocene. But we have a lot of know-how and a lot of demonstration that humanity collectively at large has the ability to improve human well-being. But, all, but the distinguishing feature of the, uh, of the Anthropocene is that we live in this highly connected world, more connected than ever before. So globalization is really nothing new in human history, but the degree and extent uh, is at a level that, that humanity has never seen before. And what this interconnection does, this, this world of, of uh, cascades where, where telecommunications and ideas and goods can, can move around the world so rapidly is create a, a complex system, an unpredictable system where, uh, where uh, Catastrophes can spread or good ideas can spread, but we live in a complex system by the formal definition of a complex system, which means that we have nonlinearities, feedbacks, and most of all, unpredictable outcomes. And we're seeing that now. So we're seeing that in the, uh, in the pandemic. This is from a couple of weeks ago. Now the, the number of global deaths is over, uh, over a million. And it's not that the world has not seen zoonotic diseases previously in human history. That's, uh, that goes back to the beginning of human civilization. But the spread is what we're dealing with. These unpredictable ways that the spread occurs throughout the world is a distinguishing feature of the Anthropocene. So previously, if a zoonotic disease such as the coronavirus had emerged, it might be likely to stay within some confined area, uh, but not spread throughout the world like we have uh, seen. So this not... So the emergence of zoonotic diseases is not something that's unpredictable. The infectious disease uh, scientists have been saying for a very long time that an event like this is going to happen at some point. But when it happens, how it plays out, how it intersects with our human decisions and governance, all of that we've seen in these last few months has just been so unpredictable and such a demonstration that, uh, that we face a lot of uncertainties in this world. Here in our part of, part of the world, is uh, we're seeing another example of the 
unpredictable effects of uh, increasing temperatures, climate change, and uh, also combined with inappropriate forest management that I'll get back to later, but the, the fires that are sweeping the American uh, West. This is particularly important to me because my children and grandchildren are breathing that air. Uh, and this has just brought down, brought home so clearly the impacts of climate change that affect people's daily lives, their homes, the air that they breathe. Uh, and we have a lot of more, a lot more unpredictable outcomes of climate change in store. If we think back uh, just a couple of decades when we were talking about the impacts of, of climate change, uh, agricultural impacts were high on the agenda, sea level rise high on the agenda. Fire was not discussed all that much, and that is turning out to be, at least in the some parts of the world, Australia, Western North America, to be a very major and very vivid impact of climate change. So we have a lot of unpredictable outcomes ahead of us. And we have the unpredictable outcome of how we govern ourselves. Who would have thought, I would have never thought, say 10 years ago, that this cast of characters are in charge of the world's largest democracies. It just would not have crossed my mind that we would be in the kind of situation that we're in today uh, in terms of how we collectively, humanity, uh, governs itself. So we have a lot of surprises in store ahead of us and unpredictability about uh, our collective ability to manage human affairs. So there's promise and peril from being in the Anthropocene. Uh, the, what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is this aspect, the unpredictable feedbacks, the perturbations, the fact that we as humanity have no prior experience, no roadmap, no manual about how to live and survive in this highly interconnected, complex system, which means uh, that we have unpredictable outcomes like diseases and fires and, and uh, governance and, uh, and this risk of cascading and uncontrollable um, failures. So I wanted to pause here and just have a little discussion about how how you think about it, how you think about being at the living in the dawn of the Anthropocene and uh, how, what you think are the biggest challenges going forward and how we balance this incredible achievements that we have in know-how about how to improve human well-being with this complex system that we live in which leads to unpredictability. So how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you think about that? Okay, feel free to uh, 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 pop questions into the chat. I'll just say, just indicate your name and we can uh, invite you. But I do invite you to just give your thoughts and responses to, to, uh, to the questions that Ruth has posed there. Well, while what we're waiting, Ruth, yeah, what do you think are the most important things that humanity needs to think about to survive in the uh, in the Anthropocene? Well, while we're waiting, Ruth, I, I'll pitch in a, a, a question. Uh, so one of the things you said that we have no prior roadmap uh, because it's a uniquely uh, nonlinear global system. Of course, throughout human history, we've had uh, societies or nation states uh, which have a lot of these nonlinearities built in at that, at that, at that finer scale uh, of civilizations. So uh, what is uniquely different about a global civilization versus the thousands of years of national or regional civilizations or empires like the Roman Empire or the Han Dynasty that must have had many of these features of complex interactions and feedback. So don't we have a roadmap that comes from, from our deeper history? Um, yes, so we can think about civilization over the long term as one big major complex system which which transforms and 
waxes and wanes. I mean, a difference today, yeah, quite right. I absolutely agree with you that civilization as a complex system is, is nothing new to humanity, but the global scale and the interconnectedness, the degree of the interconnectedness is something that is, I think, new to um, humanity. So we've had you know, Roman civilization, Mayan civilization, Indus civilizations, other civilizations that have been complex systems of their own that have transformed, you know, waxed and waned, risen and fallen. But this global connectedness is what we have um, today, which leads to the potential for very rapid cascades, such as the spread of disease, the spread of ideas, both good ones and bad ones. Uh, so it's a, a maybe a question of degree rather than a, a qualitative difference. Okay, great. Well, we've had a flood of comments and things there. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to pick a uh, pick a few of these just to uh, uh, to elaborate. But there's a wealth of ideas there, and invite those people to just propose those directly to Ruth. So, Eber, Mark, would you like to just explain your, your comment? Sure. Uh, in one of our introductory readings to our program, um, there was a, a discussion about. Um, ensuring for these kinds of cascading and escalating failures. So as these risks increase, um, which creates a very, a very strong example of a, of a very detrimental income um, inequality issue. And, and how do you think that we can ensure that ensuring ourselves against this risk doesn't, doesn't create a pay to survive kind of system? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And again, the example of the fires comes in here that, uh, that, at some point, the, because of more unpredictability, then the insurers don't even know what they're insuring against. <laughs> so if the risk becomes too high, I'm not an, I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of statistics and, uh, and uh, actuaries who work on insurance, but you know, if the risk becomes too high and too unpredictable, then who's gonna do the insurance and then you have reinsurers and then do you have reinsurers of the reinsurers and, uh, and the insurance is all built around being able to know what the risks are. Okay, thank you. I'll take a couple more. Uh, Adil Siddiqui, do you want to uh, make your comment? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was just thinking about how even though, as you say, there might not be a roadmap to know exactly how things are going to play out in this geological epoch, there is still an aspect of, of kind of determinism about it, shaped by forecasts about, you know, a million species being at risk of extinction or a variety of different temperature change paths based on what we as a civilization do or don't do, or the mass displacement that would result from those different paths. So I was just thinking about how really to me that the vital challenge in this geological epoch is how we can structure ourselves as a civilization to, to almost overcome like resignation or determinism because as you say there isn't actually a roadmap it's just we there are things that we think will happen but we're the people that decide whether or not it does yeah you know you just nailed the what i've been thinking about uh after working in the kind of science realm for so long, we think if we just have better science, if we publish one more paper, if we, you know, if we just have some more technical understanding, then uh, that leads to solving problems. But as we're seeing with this pandemic, we have all the science in the world. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns, but we have a lot of science. It's more how, how we structure ourselves to make decisions and, and organize our, our governance. And to, a, to a scientists who work on the technical side of things, that's a little bit of a hard thing to admit that that's really the major issue going forward. But I think that I agree with you. Great. And uh, we'll perhaps take one more. Uh, Michael Obersteiner, would you like to make a, make a comment? Yes, sure. Hi, hi, Ruth. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Michael. Nice to see hi. you. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, um, there, are, there are two ways to go about it. Either we research the problem quite uh, in depth and we come up with robust solutions, 
Um, and there the question is whether there is the feasibility of doing so or whether we should really spread the risk and do many, many different things and uh, really work on resilience and, you know, what you were writing about uh, learning from nature and its strategies, uh, which on the other hand is uh, rather expensive and not economically efficient if uh, an economist talks. Yeah, so that's a great lead in to, to our next conversation here, which is about what would nature do. Um, but I, well, I think in the world of science, we need to think very hard about the questions that we're asking and whether those questions will be able to help in, um, in decision making. Sometimes that's very hard to know ahead of time and we work on problems that we know are important and sooner or later, the understanding will be important for decision making. But I feel like now at this juncture, when we have such a, such a um, sort of crisis in governance, maybe I'm just sort of reeling from our US experience here, but such a crisis in governance that if we continue to just keep do better and better and more and more science and there's this disconnect, then um, are, we, are we being as effective from the scientific point of view as we, as we could be? So I struggle with that question too. I think you, everybody does. Okay. So shall we move ahead? Okay, so this question of uh, living in this unpredictable world is something that I was think I've been thinking about for many years and then tried to encapsulate the, that thinking in this book, which is supposed to be out on December 1st which is called What Would Nature Do? And this is coming from the perspective of nature evolution doesn't have a roadmap either. And can't have a roadmap because you can't know the future. Uh, and somehow nature has survived for billions of years quite well in a world that is unpredictable. Uh, asteroid crashes and extinctions and climate, swings in climate. So how did nature, what are the strategies that nature has, I won't say used because it's not that nature has a plan of itself, but that have evolved in nature to be able to persist where there is no map roadmap, where we know there's unpredictable events that, that are potentially lethal. So how, did, how does nature navigate this uncertain world? So I wrote this book over the last couple of years, uh, intended to try to take these ideas of complexity and unpredictability into some narratives and some kind of accessible type language. You can be the guide of how, uh, the judge of how successful that is or not. Uh, and I finished this book and I was sending the final manuscript to the publisher literally the week in March when the whole COVID situation and um, shutdowns were happening. I, ha I was in Cambridge and then I came back to the US with sending this manuscript in and then, uh, and then COVID, uh, everything went remote. So suddenly it took on another level of uh, significant, should I say, to think about what would nature do in these uncertain times. So, so uh, I spent a lot of time in the book trying to be convincing that we live in uncertain times, but maybe if I had written it after the pandemic, I wouldn't have, to have, have uh, worked so hard to try to convince that, that we do live with a lot of in uncertainty. So what I wanna do now is go through these strategies. So I'm sure that other ecologists or other people would think about all kinds of different strategies, but I focused on four that seem to me to be the ways that nature has been able to persist through uncertainty and think about whether these are applicable to our human civilization and whether 
there are examples where investors or engineers or some segment of our society has actually learned through trial and error that these strategies might be useful for their decisions in their realm. So I'm gonna go through these four strategies. We can stop after two if, if you wanna discuss them. But one strategy um, that is clear from evolution is about the architecture of, uh, of networks. So in our interconnected world, networks are critically important for moving goods around the world, for moving, for communication. Um, civilization really is about, our complex civilization is really about networks. So nature has, lives with networks also, and networks are critical to survival. If you take a look at a leaf, next time you go outside and look at a leaf and look at it very carefully, you'll see a lot of tiny, tiny veins throughout the leaf. So the question is, why would, um, why would uh, a leaf, a plant, invest in building all of those veins? Wouldn't it be more efficient to just construct the veins uh, in a more, you know, less veins, because it's, it's an investment of materials and energy for a plant to grow those veins. And the a leaf needs veins, or a plant needs a leaf to have veins to be able to move water throughout a leaf and to be able to bring the sugars back. So it's critically important. And the uncertainty that a, that a leaf or a plant faces is that, like you can see in this leaf that I got from my garden, so you can see what a bad gardener I am, is that, uh, is that an insect can come and take a bite out of a leaf, or a leaf can get torn. And if the network gets disrupted from that unpredictable event, the plant will suffer. So, the evolution of leaf veins has gone towards having a lot of tiny, tiny veins that make this redundant pathway. So if there is a leaf that gets an insect bite or some kind of damage, then there are always multiple routes to get around that damage. The earliest plants, the uh, ginkgo, didn't have that kind of structure. They had a more, what you might call maybe a more efficient, less veins. But over time, the benefit of having this kind of redundancy in networks shows through leaf veins. So have we learned that lesson in human societies? Well, we have. And there are some examples that I came across that show that we have learned this lesson. So one of this is uh, stories in the book is about Paul Barron, who's one of the fathers of the internet, uh, in his work on constructing the original design or his work that contributed to the construction of the original design of the internet. So when Paul Barron was young, it was during the Cold War, and the issue was how to construct the communications network to safeguard against, uh, against an attack. So Paul Barron was working for the uh, Defense Department and for AT&T, and he came up with the idea that a centralized strategy, like you see over there uh, on the left side, was the thinking of that time about how to construct communications strategies. You have a, a, a central hub with a lot of spokes. Paul Barron was young. He came up with the idea of a decentralized, so you're not so vulnerable to an attack on that central hub, but that the best strategy would be this kind of distributed strategy. So that is very akin to a leaf vein, although Paul Barron was probably not thinking about leaf veins. So he presented this idea to the uh, Defense Department and he was, laughed out of the room. He was not taken seriously at all. And he was, it was too expensive. Why would you have all of those communication hubs? But over the years, he stuck to this idea. And over the years, when the designers of the internet were constructing the architecture, came upon his ideas. And that's what became a foundation for the, uh, for the internet. So there is some learning 
that investment in what might seem like a less efficient structure, network structure, can actually be beneficial over the long term in an uncertain world where you don't know where and when an attack is going to be. So engineers have also learned this lesson uh, about redundancy. Even though it's extra cost, I don't think any of us would get on a big plane if there were not some redundant uh, engines. So that's very well established in engineering to have uh, to spend the extra investment to have redundancies when the uh, a failure would be catastrophic. But there's other segments of society where we have not really taken that lesson on board yet. Although a lot of thinking around uh, COVID is, uh, is starting to think about how to get redundancy into supply chains. So this is a map of the global food trade, which is very efficient in one way. You can see here what the trade, so coming from the red arrows, that's where the food trade is coming from and the blue is where it's going to. So you see that is the, um, the source of the food is highly concentrated in a few places, Brazil, US, Australia, and a lot of countries that are highly dependent on this, uh, this food trade. So in one sense, that's efficient because food is produced where it's cheap, cheapest to produce and, and most productive uh, areas to produce the food. But on the other hand, that creates a fragility in case there is some disruption in the network. But again, there's some positive, quite positive elements of this kind of global food trade. This is some analysis that, uh, that we did in my lab a couple of years ago to look at whether the global food trade is, um, is distributing, making the world more equitable or less equitable uh, in terms of nutrients energy, iron, protein, all of these nutrients that are important in the, in the food supply. And much to my surprise, I was thinking that we were gonna find countries that were sort of trading away their nutrients uh, to wealthier countries, but we found actually the opposite, that if we take the world as it is today, that's a big assumption, and we don't have trade, then there would be a less equitable distribution of these critical nutrients in the, uh, in the food supply. So in some sense, this global, highly concentrated um, food trade network is beneficial, but that is all a fine argument until you take into account the dynamics of the system. And we've seen some food price spikes in 2008 and 2011, which really call into question about whether it would be beneficial to, um, to have more redundancy in the global food trade and more emphasis on um, self-sufficiency and the ability for countries to be able to have, uh, like, a, like a leaf vein, when there's a bite taken out, if there's a bite taken out in some, uh, some transport line of the food supply, a country would be able to have multiple pathways to present, to prevent a volatility in the food price index and food riots, which occurred with these food price spikes. So in 2008, uh, what happened, there was Hurricane Katrina, which increased the um, demand for ethanol as a, as a um, energy source because of the damage to the, um, uh, to the port in the uh, Mississippi Delta, and that increased the food price for maize and a whole set of cascading uh, systemic chain in the, in the food system, which led to increasing food price and riots around the world. So that happened again in 2011, where there was a drought in some food producing regions, Australia, Russia. And so there was reduced, um, reduced supply, 
But what really exacerbated the increasing food prices was the reaction on the governance side, getting back to your comment, Adil, about the governance structure. The reaction that when the supply decreased to restrict exports, which further caused the food prices to spike, which led to this positive feedback of more export restrictions and this whole complex cascading system, which led to increasing prices, food riots. Um, some say that this was a contributor to the Arab Spring and then the whole geopolitical uh, change that came uh, at that time. So what we don't have in our food system is the, um, the redundancy like we have in leaf veins. So it seems to me that one of the really important kind of thinking learnings that we have going forward in the Anthropocene is about how, how we construct the networks, our networks, whether they're for food or for other goods or for communication, to be, to have the benefits of the efficiency, but to have the redundancy that protects against these kinds of cascading failures. There's another whole story in that chapter of the book, which is about diseases, which is the opposite, uh, the opposite side of the story when you want to be able to cut off a network and the way that uh, insects, social insects, such as ants and termites do that and have been able to avoid pandemics. Uh, so that's another part of the network story that we don't really have time to go into here. But, uh, but thinking about the architecture and networks is uh, something that I think we can take from nature and learn from nature and some segments of um, such as engineering uh, and the architecture of the internet have taken those lessons, learned those lessons that some investment in redundancy might, might just pay off. So that's one strategy. Another strategy, beloved to ecologists, is that, uh, that diversity is so important to keep options alive. If we look at the course of evolution, it's a, it's a march towards diversity punctuated by, uh, by periods of mass extinctions. Uh, but the reason that life has been able to persist after an asteroid crashes into the earth or some kind of uh, some kind of unpredictable impact like that is because we have because nature has so much diversity so there there is if one species goes extinct another species can come in its place uh, or if the if the environment changes another species that is more fit to that uh, new situation can uh, be present to uh, to carry on with life. So, li so diversity is like our our library of options to keep life, nature, uh, nature going despite uh, uncertainty and unpredictable impacts. So again, the finance world has learned this lesson quite well this idea of diversified bet hedging and diversification in your investments is uh is that's commonplace now it was not always commonplace and it won uh won a nobel prize <laughs> a couple of decades ago about this idea to not just have diversity in the investments but to have diversity in the types of investments so this would be the analogy of having diversity in different taxa as well as in different species. Uh, so that is quite well implanted in the uh, in the finance world. It might be it might seem at any point in time that you could get better returns if you just invested in the in the uh, highest returns at that time. But the idea of diversified bet hedging is that we live in a, a dynamic system so that uh, bet hedging will pay off in the long term. So again, in our food system, we're going in the opposite direction in that the world's food, humanity's food supply is 
becoming less and less diverse. So now in our current food system, something like 17% of uh, food types of food make up 75% of the global uh, food supply and three, three crops, white wheat, rice, and maize make up over half of the world's calories. So we're going in the other direction when it comes to our food supply with the homogenization of, um, of what we rely on, the crops that we rely on for food, and also the loss of varieties within different species. So, um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so for example, in the US, there just, not long ago, uh, there were uh, 17, something like maybe 100 or 150 years ago, there were something like 17,000 different varieties of apples in North America. And today there's 4,000, which is still a lot, but that's a big loss in diversity. Um, in, uh, in Mexico as well, the types of corn, corn types have reduced quite a lot. Anywhere you look, I'm sure the same is true in uh, Northern Europe for wheat and barley, the loss of varieties. And we might quite want to have the diversity of varieties around, particularly with climate change, to be able to breed into our crops the traits that could bring climate resilience, drought resilience, uh, that will be needed for the, uh, the future. This is quite well known. This is no big you know, revelation, but we're not going in that direction in our food supply. We do have these um, seed banks, which are just so, so important investments for humanity. I was absolutely thrilled to be able to visit uh, this, this um, seed bank in Cali, Colombia, right before the pandemic. And it's, it's quite an amazing place. I mean, all it is really is a vault of different uh, seeds, different packets of different seeds, but it's just such an incredible feeling to be there, which is just the future of humanity's food supply right there in these different containers of uh, land races. And that's what the Svalbard vault is all about, is to be able to uh, have that backup from all of these seed banks around the world when, when traits from different crop species will be required. So there is a story in the book about how, uh, how having this, the, the seed banks and having a particular uh, variety from Syria for wheat saved the crop for the wheat farmers in, in Kansas. So these kinds of stories are going to become more and more important uh, as we, we try to, the world tries to feed humanity with a changing climate. Again, going back to some of our work um, in India about going in the other direction uh, with the green revolution, which has been quite successful by many, many measures by getting farmers out of poverty and having enough calories to feed people and, and uh, famines, banishing famines to, to history. So all of that is a great achievement. But another outcome of the Green Revolution is that the diversity of um, cereals, which used to be much more diverse in people's diets and in production systems, to include many different types of millets and crops that are highly appropriate for the places that they were grown, uh, having been sort of displaced by the rice and wheat, which were the folk, focal crops of the uh, Green Revolution. So in the Anthropocene, can we think about learning that lesson or internalizing that lesson in nature about how important diversity is, not only for our investments, um, but for our food supply and also for our languages. 
for our um, diversity of worldviews, diversity of culture, of how do we keep this diversity alive, which can be so important in an unpredictable world because you never know what is going to be needed, just like the farmers in Kansas couldn't have known that a grass in Syria could have saved their, uh, saved their wheat crop, but it did. So those are two out of the four strategies. We could pause here and have some discussion or, or we could go on. What do you want to do, Yudminder? Uh, there's a couple of questions, so we can start. And if anybody else wants to uh, pop in a question into the chat box, feel free to do so now. Uh, so Audrey, would you like to pose your question or comment? One moment, I seem to have lost it. Oh yeah, um, so I, I find it's a very interesting conflict between efficiency on the one hand and then redundancy and resilience. Um, and so in our time today where efficiency is a central goal of our economic system, for example, uh, economies of scale, everyone's always talking about efficiency, efficiency. How do we advocate for the reintroduction of redundancy for resilience um, in our economic system? Yeah. So it's interesting to watch the COVID discussions around this. Like, for instance, the, the, the US is so highly dependent or has been so highly dependent on production from China for, uh, for PPE and for hand sanitizer and for all of these things that all of a sudden became just so incredibly essential. And there has been I mean, I've seen a lot of writings now, how that turns into actual action, uh, we'll have to watch, but about uh, the need to, um, to have some more redundancy and reduce that sole source dependency for essential items. Now, who, you know, it's hard to know what is really essential for the future. Who would have thought that I mean, people would think that toilet paper is so incredibly essential. Um, but it's, it, it's come out quite a lot in the COVID or COVID era about uh, getting redundancy back. So what a leaf does, you know, it is an investment to have redundancy. It costs more. You're losing efficiency. What the right balance is, is a, is, you know, is a really open question. And, uh, and the way that a leaf vein balances that question is by keeping these, um, according to the physicists who study this, which is fascinating, keeping the investments for those very small veins that are keeping that redundancy alive, that's a, that's a, a, a small investment. So it's that balance. Like you could have a highly, highly redundant leaf vein, but then you'd have to invest, the leaf would have to invest a whole lot in building all of those veins. But the investment is less, and that might be a bit of a trade-off in the redundancy. But where does that trade-off lie between redundancy and efficiency? And in our society, particularly in our food system, we've gone way far on the efficiency side. But I wouldn't say that the answer is for, um, you know, the romantic idea that everybody should be off the grid and, and self-sufficient and countries should try to produce all their own food and not, you know, be isolationist. I don't think, I think that's going too far in the other way, because then when something happens in your country, you want to be able to draw on, uh, on production somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nishant, would you like to pose your question? Am I audible now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Hi, Ruth. Hi. Like, sorry if you are going to cover this later in your talk, but I was interested in the flow across different countries, like you showed it for food. I wanted your commentary in context of waste as well. And when we consider waste as an urban common or a societal common, it has like a very dynamic characteristic in terms of like resilience, redundancy, depending upon what stakeholder are we talking about. So that stakeholder can be few people within the society and also it can vary from developed nations to developing nations when we move waste from a very developed nations or economically strong nations. Thanks. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. And I think it does come up a bit in this next strategy, which is about cycling. <laughs> and you know, there is really no concept of waste in nature um, because anything that we might think about waste is, is useful to some other part of um, nature. Somebody's getting, some, a microbe is getting energy from decomposing the, uh, the waste. But your comment is, you know, applies to the um, redundancy in networks about waste disposals as much as it does to getting food. For instance, the, you, I keep using US-China examples and I'm sorry to keep drawing on that example, but China has been so much the place where US has essentially dumped its, its waste. And that is, um, that's not available so much anymore. And the whole recycling in the US is sort of in, it's not clear what's going to happen with all that, that, um, that waste. So your comment, I think, is, is really important to thinking about redundancy about how we get rid of our waste or preferably to figure out how to make our waste valuable. <laughs> Um, and usable. This is the closed economy kind of uh, thinking, which has been, which is so important. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Hani, would you like to pose your question? Sure. Um, so really interesting and thought provoking. Um, I was thinking about the um, these redundant networks in leaves, but there are other examples in nature where networks are less redundant, say in uh, roots uh, or ste uh, uh, tree stems and branches. Um, so I was wondering if instead of thinking about making everything redundant, should we also be thinking about which networks we ought to be striving for redundancy and other ones maybe less so and what, what we, uh, which kind of networks we really do want redundancy in. Exactly, so that you just said the point of chapter two in the book, much better than I said it. Uh, it's more, the point is um, fitting the architecture of the network to the purpose. Mm. So when it comes to disease, this interconnection and redundancy is definitely not a positive thing because that yeah. allows disease to spread. So the way that insects, social insects who live in nests have managed that problem is to have modular networks so that when there's a pathogen that comes into the nest, a whole cluster, a whole module can cut itself off. That would be the equivalent of, you know, stopping travel between hmm. the Europe and the US, I guess. Um, but that's the way, that's the way that network has been designed to make it uh, resilient to pandemics, which are a huge threat for any species that lives in crowded conditions like that. So yes, so this redundancy is one example where you want the flow, but other examples, like you're saying, where you'd want to think about the right architecture or how you learn from nature's architecture for different purposes. Right. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question, maybe, and then we'll move on. Uh, Vivek, would you like to pose your comment, question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm speaking from a state called Odisha in uh, um, India. Uh, here, uh, uh, the temples uh, carry, especially a big, big temple in uh, Odisha, they have a practice of uh, asking uh, farmers and uh, d uh, devotees to come and uh, uh, devote uh, rice uh, as a uh, like a, a present presentation to God. Uh, every year they have to bring in four, four or five different varieties of rice uh, as a cooked meal uh, to present in front of the God. So like that, uh, several beliefs, norms, and various uh, practices ha had been there. How to rekindle those kind of traditional practices which were inbuilt in them for redundancy and uh, resilience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think in Orissa you have, I believe, so many, such diversity of yeah. rice yeah. varieties, thousands, yeah. Yeah. thousands of yeah. rice yeah. varieties, which I yeah. think, you know, I think farmers, from my perception, farmers are very aware 
that those yeah. different varieties are important for different conditions, different climate conditions, different soil conditions. And, yeah. you know, the, the paradigm has been, the sort of modern paradigm has been that the hybrid rice or, you know, the so-called more efficient rice is yeah. what's getting pushed on the farmers. But I think, yeah. you know, I think there's more and more aware. I mean, I think farmers have always been aware of this, but more recognition about how important keeping those varieties alive are, even if they might have lower yield or might require more labor. Other, other important challenge is how to make other cultures to mimic this particular tradition from particular uh, community of people. How to do ritual shopping. How, how, why can't we may go for ritual shopping from other cultures to build our, uh, like enrich our adaptive toolkits in every cultures. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's quite um, interesting to watch in India that the, these, um, these uh, traditional cereals, like you have in a recent addition to all of the rice varieties, the millets, the, uh, you know, yeah. the sorghum and millets, which have previously been more important parts of the diet that have, yeah. that have the status of, of being so-called poor people's food. But now, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this. Now, those are the yeah. cereals that are so trendy in yeah. urban high-end markets. Yeah. So it's fascinating to see this shift. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. We've got a few more great questions there, but I think we'll move on now and maybe return to a couple of these uh, at the end as well. Okay. All right. So I have two more strategies to talk to you about, and then we can come back to that. Uh, so another strategy of nature is that, uh, as we were saying with the waste, that, that nature has this incredible ability to self-correct without, uh, without sort of anyone uh, having to do anything intentional to put into place those self-corrections. So these are the negative feedback processes in nature. And on a geologic time scale, there's no better example of a negative feedback uh, in the carbon cycle, which keeps the, uh, the temperature of the earth, the climate, fairly stable through geologic history. So this is the process through which the, uh, the, the CO2, which gets into the air through volcanoes, is taken out of the air through the process of rock weathering. And that is a temperature dependent process. So the higher the temperature, the more CO2 gets taken out of the air in the weathering process. And the lower the temperature, the less CO2 gets taken out of the air. So then the temperature increases. So we have this beautiful uh, negative feedback process in nature, which has kept our planet uh, possible for life to, uh, life to evolve. So nature is full of those sorts of negative feedback, self-correcting processes, whether it's in predator-prey interactions, whether it's in uh, physiology, like, the pro like our human physiology of sweating when it's too hot, which cools us off, and shivering when it's too cold, which warms us up, or the regulation of insulin. Lots of examples in, uh, in, in global scale biogeochemical cycles down to, uh, hum down to physiology, which show how pervasive and important these sort of self-regulating processes are in nature. And again, the finance world has really taken on this lesson, although you know, not because of nature, but because it works. So uh, I think with COVID, with what happened with the, with the volatile stock market uh, back in, in March and continuing, uh, the importance of these circuit breakers in the, in the stock market. So the idea is, and this is not very old, just a couple of decades that the finance world put in place this self-regulating feature that if the stock market uh, dives too quickly and too deeply, then it pauses and it halts and it gives time for the market to, uh, to uh, stabilize. 
and come back. So this is an example of the flash crash, which happened on uh, May 6th in 2010. And if it had not been for that circuit breaker that, is, uh, that was embedded for a self-correcting feature, uh, the stock market would have tanked. Uh, who knows what would have happened. And we saw this back in March when the stock market started to tank and the circuit breakers went in place. And each time there was a, a, there was a revision of the rules for the, uh, the circuit breakers. So that idea of stabilizing, um, these stabilizing forces, which can right the system before it can crash too far, is, uh, is clearly something that the finance world has taken on board and continual, continues to revise its, uh, revise its rules. So an example where that has, this self-regulating feature has not been taken on board so well, or it has been learned over the process of a century, goes back to the fires like we're having out in the um, American West uh, currently. So the, this is a very American phenomenon. So sorry about that. Uh, Smokey Bear, who is so adorable and cute and everybody loves Smokey Bear. Uh, Smokey Bear's message was to put out all fires. Fires are bad. This idea came from German forestry that, uh, that a system has no place for fires, that, that it should be, they should just be put out to, to protect the timber. So when this idea coming into the American West and into Australia has contributed to the disaster we're seeing today with the fires, because the indigenous way of managing fires in these um, fire prone areas, such as the American West and Australia and Mediterranean, is to have small fires to reduce the, the fuel load so that when there is a fire, it's not catastrophic and enormous and disastrous. So that's the way the, the forests were managed for millennia until the European model came in, which was that all fires should be put out. And it took a, a century of learning by the forest department. I have this story in the book about how the forest department learned this lesson over a long time that small fires are actually beneficial in these fire prone landscapes to reduce damage from big, uh, big fires. So there has been that kind of learning about the importance of these self-regulating features. Um, but at this point, although prescribed fires are part of, of, um, of forest management today in the US, it's so hard to put that into practice because there's people living in these areas, they don't want to smoke, and it's very hard to implement prescribed fires to cut back on the, uh, on the fuel load. So that's another example of learning that these, this took a long time, but learning that these self-regulating feedback, such as having those small fires, allowing those small fires, which prevent a crash, like could happen if you didn't have a circuit breaker in the stock market, or if you didn't have the balance between the weathering process and volcanoes in the long-term geologic carbon cycle, um, is something that humanity learns, I think we're learning um, in many different systems. So here's just an example of how disastrous these fires are and how, how much damage there is to property and lives and, uh, you know, I hear all, all kinds of stories, <laughs> smoke, millions of people breathing the smoke and uh, personal stories about how much this is affecting um, their lives. So building this self-correcting feature of small fires back into fire management in these areas is certainly a goal for, um, for moving forward in the Anthropocene in those areas. Finally, okay, last, last strategy, and then we can have a discussion about all of this, is, um, is the learnings that Eleanor Ostrom uh, brought to us so, so wonderfully and uh, got the Nobel Prize for her 
her um, work on recognizing the value of self-organization in systems. So she, Eleanor Ostrom, countered the idea of tragedy of the commons that uh, Garrett Hardin brought to us that people will always be destructive of their environment, of their common, if there's not some top-down management, some regulation, some kind of you know, top-down force that prevents people from destroying their environments. And Eleanor Ostrom, through her work on, uh, which started out with studying the Los Angeles um, Police Department and uh, and then natural resource management, forest, community forests, and a lot of different um, common, common resource studies about how, it, how communities can, if the conditions are right, to self-organize and manage their resources better than a top-down um, top force because people know what's good for them if they have, she has her, many of you have probably studied Eleanor Ostrom's eight design principles of having control over enforcement and having uh, uh, different, um, you know, boundaries on the resource, all of these different design principles that Eleanor Ostrom so beautifully articulated to create the enabling conditions where communities can self-organize to be able to manage their systems. And that's what nature does. We might think about a queen bee or a queen ant, but there's really no such thing as a queen sitting in the middle of the nest, directing traffic and telling each ant which way to go. The queen does not have the information or the ability to be able to, uh, to, be able to direct ants to where they should go to be able to carry food back to the nest. So nature has this wonderful, um, strategies of, of um, these self-emergent properties where all an ant is doing is following the pheromones which are telling it to follow the ant in front of them and leave clues for the ant behind it. An ant is not thinking about what's the grand strategy to be able to walk in a line. An ant is responding only to its very local conditions because that's where the information is most available about what the local condition is. So there's some stories in the, in the book about uh, this kind of bottom-up strategy and how it was so uh, delightful to have the opportunity to read a lot about Eleanor Ostrom's um, work about this bottom-up idea that can be so powerful in how humans manage their affairs, if the conditions are right. She was not a sort of romantic that every problem can be solved by bottom-up control, but that the conditions need to be right. People need to have control over their decision-making powers and enforcement where um, self-emergent um, bottom-up management can be successful. So we saw this in some degree in the, uh, in the Paris climate uh, UNFCCC uh, process, which is far from sufficient. We all know that the agreement that the countries made in Paris will not completely solve our climate problem and there's a lot more work to be done, but it was a, a success, really the only time that countries have collectively agreed to, uh, to commit to some reduction mitigation um, strategies. And how that happened was because the, the, the um, strategy completely flipped from previous COPs where the strategy was that you know, there's, this, there's this pie and countries need to figure out how to divide up the pie for their emission allocation to a strategy where a bottom-up strategy, where countries bring to the table what they think they can uh, achieve in their emissions uh, reductions. So taking on board this 
bottom-up idea as opposed to the top-down imposition. So countries, it was a success in terms of countries agreeing uh, collectively to the commitments that they made, which were coming from, from them, not from somebody else telling them what they should commit to, as a, as a sort of some kind of inkling that this idea, uh, Ostrom's beautiful work, and this idea of, uh, of the importance of, of bottom-up solutions can have a place in the, uh, in the Anthropocene. So that was the fourth strategy that, uh, that there's a chapter in the book about. So, uh, so those are the sort of the, the principles that I was taking from nature and thinking about what are the examples where humanity has taken on board these strategies from nature, even though they might not be recognized as such, and where we might be able to think about using these strategies in the, uh, in the Anthropocene moving forward. So I think I'm not as much, you know, I try to be an optimist and think that over time, just like the ginkgo, just as evolution evolved to have redundant leaf veins and started out with the ginkgo strategy, humanity will learn over time that these sorts of strategies that you know so much moving towards the efficiency side at the expense of redundancy and diversity uh, is to our benefit i think we will learn that through trial and error and that's what we we move forward with with in the anthro anthropocene how can we turn our anxiety about the future to steps that we can take to how we live with uncertainty and minimize shocks to humanity moving forward. So I look forward to your thoughts, comments. Great, thank, thank you Ruth. That's the first round of this. Uh, okay, we'll move over to a bit of a discussion session now for about a quarter of an hour. So feel free to pop in your, your questions. Uh, I'd like to kick off with uh, uh, Sofia uh, Stefanovic. It was uh, uh, something you wrote a bit earlier, that in some senses, perhaps uh, proposing a, a fifth principle. Do you want to uh, give your analogy? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I was just wondering how uh, growth in natural systems fits into the framework you presented. First of all, thank you for setting out these four principles. I think we have a lot to learn from how natural systems organize. I was just wondering where growth fits in. So I gave an example of a cell. Um, when the ratio between the surface area of the cell and the volume becomes too low, the cell stop, stops growing because at some point it's just not sustainable to get in the material in and out to support the metabolic processes in the cell. And this is what we see throughout the natural world. world. So this limits to growth or st growth stops when it just stops being sustainable to, to sustain a system that is too large. And I was wondering what parallels we can draw um, from here and what we can learn in terms of how we think about our economies that seem to be pursuing growth for the sake of pursuing growth. So as an end, as someone mentioned in the comments later on, as an end rather than the means to achieving, say, a decent life for everyone. So how do we, what do we have to learn in terms of how growth exists in natural systems? Um, and it just seems, it seems at this point <laughs> ridiculous to me that we cannot, that, that these discussions exist on the margin and not in the mainstream. So thinking about what happens when growth stops because it's stopping in many places and what happens uh, when it's not desirable to keep growing. So what's the plan? How do we move from there? So I think that that's my question. So for, I guess, our generation, how do we move from thinking about growth as something that equates progress? Yeah. Sorry, that was okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to give you a good answer for, for, uh, <laughs> for your generation, but a feature of complex systems, of complex adaptive systems, is that they go through these periods of growth, and then stagnate, and then, um, and then 
um, collapse, <laughs> you can think about it that way, and then have a period of, of regrowth. So it's this constant, uh, you know, constant kind of figure eight of growth, stagnation, destruction, and regeneration. And uh, Buzz Holling did this, uh, the, the ecologist Buzz Holling uh, has this in his panarchy work about this cycle of growth and destruction and, and regeneration. So if you think about civilizations over the long term, that's really what it is, you know, increasing complexity to the point where the system can't sustain itself because it's so complex and then, um, and then collapse and then regeneration of, of, uh, of another civilization. So that's kind of the process over the long term of human civilization. But that doesn't mean that we just sit back and say, okay, well, that's the process in complex adaptive systems. So we have to just accept that we're going to collapse. That, that first of all, to create the conditions which enable the growth to occur uh, after the collapse. But I don't, I, you know, I try to, I'm not a doomsday kind of, we're on the verge of the collapse of civilization. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm saying that the pattern in complex adaptive systems is exactly that, growth until it can't be sustained and then reorganization. So how do we keep the options alive to have that reorganization occur um, quickly, like having our diversity intact and, uh, and having our ideas and, and worldviews that uh, that enable us to transform when we know that this you know indefinite growth is not the way that complex adaptive systems can survive over the indefinitely. I'm not sure that answers your question at all. Okay, uh, thank you. So there's a, uh, another question. Uh, Moving over to Jody, would you like to pre present your, your comment, question? Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Um, it's a really fascinating uh, seminar. I just uh, was really intrigued by your idea of decisions from the bottom up and um, just how the military uses this. They call it mission command. And the principle is that as long as the whole unit get to a defined goal, they don't really mind how the subunits get there. Um, it's a way of uh, allowing kind of local knowledge and local ground truth to be able to um, organize large groups of people in a way that, uh, you know, is for the collective good. But it only works when you have a really defined mission and that everyone is completely aware of it. Do you think in that sense that our supranational organizations are like robust enough and have that defined, uh, defined mission um, and everyone's best interests at heart, given the plethora of sort of vested interests that we're all, we're all up against? Yeah. That's a great example. I wish I had had that example in the book. <laughs> um, that is one of Eleanor Ostrom's design print, one of the eight design principles, is having a defined goal that everyone agrees with. And you could think about that, um, a, a, a goal like that for a military unit or for a cohesive community that's uh, sort of self-sufficient and needs to maintain it, maintain itself sort of isolated from the world. But then when we get into this, uh, the, the modern world where there's so, so many interconnections and so many vested interests and you don't ha really have homogeneous communities that have a single goal, that, that, uh, that led to Eleanor Ostrom's writings about what she calls it polycentric institutions we have institutions at different levels. So um, I completely agree that if there's not an agreed upon clear goal, then the bottom up management, um, how do you organize bottom up management? Um, except to think that ants, which I see in a chat that someone thinks that's an imperfect analogy, and I completely agree with you, it is an imperfect analogy because humans are not ants that just instinctively follow what their hormones tell them to do. Um, they don't have the collective in mind. They don't have a goal in mind. They are following their local 
information. So you could say that the invisible hand, you know, Adam Smith's famous invisible hand is an example of self-organized behavior, which leads to some positive outcomes like efficiency perhaps, but also leads to some negative outcomes like, um, like inequities and uh, you know, growth at all costs and individual benefit at all costs. Um, so that's, I think, the sort of the, the taking away from Eleanor Ostrom is how do, you, how do you identify those sort of systems where a bottom-up strategy could be, uh, could be effective and what are the, what's the role for leadership? The role for leadership is identifying where, those, where a bottom-up strategy could be effective, like the military leaders. And in those situations, allowing a bottom-up strategy to emerge, but then where it is not an appropriate strategy to, to, um, to have leadership that doesn't rely on that bottom-up. Maybe that's a, a way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay, perhaps maybe one or two more. Uh, Clara Butel, do you want to add your follow-up question to Sophia's comment? Um, yes, I was wondering about um, the variables that would enhance the reorganization or transformation of our system prior to collapse, since you were just elaborating on um, yeah, this whole growth perspective. What would allow uh, transformations? Exactly. What would allow us to not have to enter this state of collapse um, so we can enter a new kind of reorganization of our system? and um, what can strengthen this transformation? Ah, that... <laughs> well, is, yeah. yeah. Is there ways of avoiding the collapse? I think that's what I'm asking. I don't know if avoid, I, I think it's sort of thinking about reorganization of systems and what allows a reorganization. So the kind of um, innovations that, that are occurring in, in, you know, in social systems and people thinking about different, different ways to organize their communities. I think you're far ahead of that in Europe than, than we are in the US in thinking about how, how we transform from the, our food system, which is becoming more and more homogeneous to, um, to have more diversity and have more locally appropriate <laughs> production and consumption systems. I mean, all of those, I see those as kind of moves towards transformation. Right, what do you think? I'll turn the question around on you. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure there is. I was just, yeah, thinking about how can we try and get this transformation moving in a better way. So I see diversity definitely is a big point, but what about, yeah, really the, see, looking at the political systems, looking at the economy, looking at all of these things that desperately need to change for our system to yeah, keep surviving yeah. in a better way. Um, yeah. Often change happens when there's a crisis and um, like the, the Black Lives Movement here in the US, We'll see. It's, it's too early to say whether that's really transformative, but it has the potential. That has the potential to be transformative. I mean, there's a long way to go and many inequities to correct, but that potentially is is a transformative crisis. Okay, thank you. Your own Winston Churchill said that every crisis is an opportunity. Would you say COVID is a good opportunity? Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah. I mean, just this thinking about redundancy in the supply chain seems like it could, could be an uh, opportunity for some transformation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll take uh, perhaps one more. Nishant, would you like to make a comment? Are you there, Hi. Nishant? Hi, Ruth. Uh, thanks for those comments. I was only trying to differentiate in between ant colonies and the human colonies on the basis of rationality. So 
what we do in terms of refinement of our rationalization happens through endowment of genes or strategies in animals. So the idea is if an ant colony or members of an ant colony do not follow certain strategy, they are exterminated from the face of the whole genome or gene pool. Coming back to like making slight comment on Eleanor Ostrom's work, which was largely being discussed. I think it is very well discussed in Jared Hardin's paper in 1968, which is again about the tragedy of commons, wherein once we try to achieve the optimization of welfare and optimization of numbers, that's where we are quite puzzled because the like, optimization of both of these is never possible. And as and when we have like higher goals in governance, that bottom-up approach is more efficient because it somehow fills the holes better than trying to do it from top down. So just a yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And and I completely agree. The analogy with uh, ants is is not not uh, what we'd want to do in human societies. I mean, ants take their infected uh, nest mates and, and let them die outside the nest. So that is certainly not something to, <laughs> that is uh, something that would be appropriate for human society. But the idea it, that the ant or the, uh, the local community or the local individual is in the position to best know what the local situation is, that's the, uh, that's the basis for the sort of bottom up um, yeah, you really idea. See that. But, and that's also different. that the, the idea that in, as you said, that in, in ants, it's instinctive, it's genetic. They follow the, the pheromones. But in, in human societies, ideas, ideas are like genes. Yep. We wouldn't want everybody to be a robot well, that follows exclusively. Really yeah. Of yeah. But of course, ants and similar insect colonies allow us to identify how quickly a strategy gets washed out or make it gets obliterated from a system if it does not adhere to the success of the colony. So that's where like a lot of researchers on entomology talk about human welfare from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, we are a very unique species in that we, um, we care for individuals which, um, which have a yeah, care for. These questions because we are puzzling with questions when human societies interact with animals. So that's where like, a lot of confusion arises. So I just give it a slight caution. That's it. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're on the hour now, so I think it's, it's a good time to, to wrap up. But uh, thank you, Ruth, for that uh, certainly very thought-provoking and big-picture view about uh, resilience and, and, uh, and the challenges of navigating the Anthropocene. And it fits in perfectly into the range of lectures our students are having this week around the Anthropocene and how to think about it and the fundamental, deep, profound issues that the Anthropocene raises. But it's interesting to see how you kicked off with such a positive view of the Anthropocene's opportunity, which is not, not always a signaling that it comes from, 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 from uh, all the writers on this topic as well. So that, that makes it a, a very fascinating starting point. So thank you very much. I'd like to give you a round of applause. If you feel free to switch off your mic so you can hear our collective hands of applause. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to spend this time with you. Uh, and we have recorded this. We'll, uh, uh, make this available through our YouTube channel as well. So if anybody wants to follow up and see this lecture again, and of course the students will have it in their course materials as well and upload, upload it as well. Okay, thank okay, you very much. great, thanks so much. Bye-bye Ruth, thank you. Bye.